But then that's your cue. No, I didn't know that. Where's my music? It, it played. Sorry. Oh, didn't hear it. Okay. Hi. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to UNC Greensboro's Special Collections University Archives First Fridays. Today, uh, we are excited to have uh, university archivist Lauren Moore and digital technology curator Richard Cox to discuss their project, Well-Crafted North Carolina, a project documents the history of beer and brewing in North Carolina. Uh, Aaron also wanted me to point out that he's uh, a special guest, Jasper DeCorgi, might or might not also join in to the program to share his thoughts, so. Hi, Aaron, hi, Richard. Hey, Beth Ann. Hi, wow. Uh, okay, very you those figurines. Okay, so oh, this is only a small portion, but you know. Okay, well, are any of them drinking beer? Yeah, well, let me so let me bring up my share screen. How did I get? Okay, can y'all see that? Yes, Erin Laramore, I can. <laughs> Thank you, Beth Ann Kelsch, who uh, I've been I've been on research leave for a month, and Beth Ann forgot my name already. <laughs> what did I call you? You you tr you just went with my last name and then twisted it a little bit into a full name. Oh, okay. Sorry yeah, it about. was it was fun and exciting. Okay, well. <laughs> let's let's move ahead, shall we? But we all knew who you were talking about, so that is oh. okay. All right, I am so, so, so please, uh, Aaron Richard, share with us what's go what what we have here. Yes, we will move forward, forward and onward. Um, so most of y'all know about Well Crafted, how it got started, what we do with it. One of the things we wanted to talk about today, um is the honestly the value of it the research value um I, I as i mentioned just a second ago i am on research leave this semester with a 100 percent focus on well crafted on um both research conducting oral history interviews um digitizing materials that folks uh have hold in their possession about north carolina beer history um for instance, last week I went to Appalachian State. I'm trying to knock out folks who work at universities sooner rather than later because of the semester starting. But last week I was at Appalachian State interviewing um, the person who's the head of their fermentation sciences program, which teaches, it's a four year program that teaches not only the chemistry of uh, beer brewing, but also other types of fermentation like um, cheeses, meats. They were actually, they have a little smoker out back that's awesome. Um, they call their smoker Audrey Hip, or Audrey Heartburn, sorry, um, because it's it smokes. Um, <laughs> it's smoking. That was their theory behind the name. Um, but, uh, you know, I talked with, with Dr. Taubman there about their program, the students who come through the program, what they're trying to uh, teach um it's it's a very cool program next week on on tuesday i actually go to nc state to talk to sebastian wolfram who uh runs the brewing sciences program that has actually just launched as a minor um in the food sciences program at nc state and sebastian wolfram comes from uh greensboro uh well he originally comes from germany but when he came over, he actually was one of the earliest, um, one of the first brewers, not the first, but one of the first brewers at Natty Greens. Um, he was one of the founding members of the North Carolina Craft uh, Brewers Guild. He also uh, owns and operates Epiphany Malt Company, which is one of the malt houses based in North Carolina. He's a great and fascinating guy. And if anybody's ever heard of um, Eyanger, which is a German beer, that's actually kind of where he 
got his start was working there. But, you know, we're collecting, I'm collecting these stories, doing this research, trying to figure out all of this because the history of beer, it really kind of falls into the broader history of both North Carolina and the United States. Um, a lot of the changes that have, uh, that you see in the beer industry are changes that are on a global perspective. In some ways, it's, I kind of liken it to my work as university archivist. Um, you know, you can study the history of the United States through the lens of UNCG. With Well Crafted, we study the history of the United States through the lens of beer. Um, inevitably, you always kind of get the side eye, like, I, I wish I had a dollar for the side eyes and the laugh I got every time I said I was going to go and research or even focus solely on beer history. Um, but it really is kind of delving into broader issues of labor history, women's history, immigrant history, religion, um, everything that you would study in, in American studies, you're going to find that you could study through beer history. And so today, Richard and I are going to tell a few stories, um, introduce you to four people who uh, range the time of, of that we've been studying, starting in the 1700s, and which Actually, a lot of some of what we've done is goes back to the 1600s, but starting in the 1700s, ending with someone who literally just sold his brewery last year. Um, but we will get started with me talking about one of my favorite ladies. So the picture there is Elizabeth Maxwell Steele. Just for a little context, the word ordinary is used throughout the colonial period in laws and legal documents and often um, it's used interchangeably with the word tavern. Um, there were some times when people would make distinctions between the two. Ordinaries were kind of, um, it's kind of like differentiating between a, a uh, brew pub and a bar. Um, Ordinaries were often kind of second rate country houses that just happened to be the place you would stop as you were going along somewhere. And taverns were fancier and first class and often found in towns. Um, but in theory, they were the same thing and often, if not always, subjected to the same kind of laws. So many of the ordinary tavern and tavern keepers were county leaders, folks like sheriffs, merchants, justices of the peace. But there were also a lot of women ordinary owners, um, perhaps up to about 25% in some counties in North Carolina. About half of the female tavern keepers actually took out licenses to continue the work in their deceased husband's name. Um, honestly, probably just in order to continue their own personal livelihood. Um, Generally, these women kept their ordinaries for only about one, two, maybe three years before giving up their license. But there are some instances where women kept going for, for decades, um, running, running their ordinaries. Um, one of these was Elizabeth Maxwell Steele. So Elizabeth's family arrived in the North Carolina backcountry, which is pretty much now what Salisbury. Um, in the second quarter of the 18th century. Elizabeth was born in 1733 and around 1750, she actually, she married a woman, she, she did not marry a woman because that would have been illegal at the time. She uh, married Robert Gillespie, a guy who ran an ordinary in Salisbury starting in 1756. While returning home to Salisbury from Fort Dobbs during the Cherokee War in um, 1759, Robert was actually slain and scalped. So Elizabeth was left behind not long after they got married, but she had this tavern and she was able to kind of keep that license and keep the business going. So the next year in 1760, she used some of that money to buy land in the North Square of Salisbury to operate her own tavern, her own place. And it was really, really successful. She actually did well enough to continue buying land in Salisbury and across what was then Rowan County, which was basically the western part of the state, um, for years to come. In 1763, she married another tavern owner, William Steele. He died 10 years later, but they kind of were able to consolidate some of the business. 
Elizabeth's Tavern was very highly regarded. And one traveler actually wrote in his diary in 1776 that Elizabeth, quote, kept the best tavern. Her operations were so successful that she also employed a blacksmith and a carpenter. She also owned five enslaved people, which was a large total for any resident of the North Carolina backcountry. She did business uh, with many prominent leaders in the region, including the leader of the Surrey County Patriots and uh, William Davy, who was a Patriot leader in the area. The tavern wasn't necessarily called Elizabeth's Tavern. It was just known as Elizabeth's Tavern. A lot of these taverns didn't actually have formal names. They just got called something and it stuck. Um, but they were usually just indicated, honestly, by a placard at the front of the building. So you typically didn't have to have a formal name. You just registered it as Elizabeth Maxwell Steele's Tavern. So as you probably can guess though, her tavern was a community gathering space and a place where news was shared. Elizabeth prided herself on that. And she actually would write to family members across the um, Eastern seaboard to try and learn more about what was happening during the Revolutionary War outside of the North Carolina backcountry. In the fall of 1780, she wrote her brother-in-law Ephraim in Pennsylvania, because of course he was named Ephraim from Pennsylvania asking for information about the war that engulfed the new United States. Um, she had two sons who served in the military, but she actually felt that as a tavern or owner, she was actually obligated to get this kind of information. Um, she would frequently write to Ephraim and ask him to send, and she would use the phrase Northern intelligence. Um, and she would flat out tell him I need all the information I can get. And she referred to herself as a great politician, meaning she was sharing the news of politics. So Elizabeth would also send information that she gathered in her tavern about wartime activities in the South up to Ephraim. Only 16 days after the 1780 British attack on Charleston, Elizabeth actually wrote to Ephraim, quote, I'm sorry that I can't, knowing you to be a good Whig, make you happy with some news from Charleston. We every day expect to hear of a general storm on or the continued blockade of Charleston, six or 7,000 we conjecture on each side. So by 1781, the war had moved closer to Elizabeth and to Salisbury. Um, as British forces began to move into North Carolina, the Continental Army commanded by General Nathaniel Green began to move through the region to prepare defenses. In February of 1781, so the story goes, stories are always the best, um, General Green rode into Salisbury alone. He entered Elizabeth's Tavern and he was joined by a surgeon from Daniel Morgan's army who was busy writing out pearl papers for sick and wounded soldiers. General Green appeared disheveled and um, Dr. Reed actually inquired about his condition. And Green reportedly replied, yes, I'm fatigued, hungry, alone, and penniless. Elizabeth overheard General Green's remarks. She entered the room, to him, plopped down on the table, two big bags of money, and stated, quote, take these, General, you need them, and I can do without them. General Green then left the tavern, newly financed and encouraged, um, and, but this is my favorite part, before departing, he removed a portrait of King George from the wall and wrote on the back of it, oh George, hide thy face and mourn. And supposedly this portrait still resides in the Presbyterian church in downtown Salisbury. And yes, that is the picture of General Green looking all hang dog faced and sad and um, Elizabeth, consoling him, I guess, before she brought the two giant bags of money. So we don't know a lot about Elizabeth's life after the war, although she does kind of continue uh, to appear in public records as the head of the house. Her son likely took over operation of the tavern, but as late as 1788, Elizabeth was still buying more and more land around Salisbury. She bought some of the newly available property that was seized by the state during the revolution and uh, eventually became one of, if not the largest landholder in Salisbury, definitely the woman who held the most land in that area. 
Um, Elizabeth died on November 22nd, 1790. She was in her late 50s and she had outlived one of her sons, two husbands and a grandchild. And she is buried in Salisbury. So I'm going to turn it over to Richard now, who's going to tell you a couple of more stories um, where beer and brewing kind of intersect with bigger social and cultural issues and histories. Okay, so if my first, first one I'm going to talk about is going to be um, it's actually a place where my other project, the Digital Library on American Slavery and Well Crafted NC, converged on one another and started informing one another and research came out from both ends and has worked to actually benefit both projects. So I'm going to be talking about a gentleman I've been doing a significant amount of research on with a register of deeds in Orange County um, named Africa Parker. So I'll be talking a lot about what I know about his life, which is not a lot. Um, and I'll also mention um, a, an ordinary per Kathleen's curiosity earlier. Um, so I'll start by mentioning that that building on the lower left um, was built sometime between 1754 and 1768 and is known as William Reed's Ordinary and later known as Seven Hearths because it had seven fireplaces. Um, it was built on the Stillhouse Branch Creek in Hillsboro in Orange County and has served as a tavern that I know of at least twice. It still stands, is a house that is lived in and is considered historic property. So I mentioned, go ahead and mention this building and this location because it's gonna play into what I know about Africa later. So the earliest mission I've found of Africa was actually in 1776. Um, and it's where his last name actually eventually will come from. At the time he was enslaved to a man named James Parker. Um, on August 28th of 1782, um, Africa was sold to a man named William Courtney, a Quaker, for 1,005 pounds. And by 1784, William Courtney also became the owner of the land on which William Reed's Ordinary sits. So the building has come back around into it already. On January 7th of 1790, William Courtney deeded the property to his grandson, Josiah Watts Jr., um, who in 1798, um, in his will, left it to the state to his brother, Thomas Watts. Now, remember these Watts names as well. They're all going to come back around, which is part of what ties us into the LAS is all the importance of people's names. So in November of 1798, Africa shows up in a deed as an enslaved person when William Courtney used him as collateral in a loan to another gentleman named William Kane, who was also a Quaker. This loan eventually defaulted to William Kane, and as a result, Africa became the property of Kane. Within three months, Africa Parker was emancipated by Kane. Kane said about Africa, and I quote, Africa hath rendered unto your petitioner several meritorious services of high importance to him. Amongst others hath taught and instructed your petitioner and one of his other slaves in the art and mastery of malting, brewing, and distilling grain, whereby your petitioner hopes to derive great profit and gain. So Africa, we are have now discovered is someone who is very experienced in not only making beer, but also distilling liquor. Um, and sure, he was given this freedom, well, given. He was worked for his freedom because he basically paid for it through, you know, they were going to make more money basically because of what he did, so they freed him. Perhaps that's a ruse because we are talking about a Quaker who only is in possession of Africa for a few months, but we can only, there's only conjecture about that. The point is he was enslaved. He taught, he taught others how to make beer and was emancipated as a result. This is when he was given the last name Parker by the court, which again was the last name of the at least the earliest enslaver of his that I can find. On June 18, 1799, an indenture was made between Thomas Watts, Orange County, you remember the Watts name, it's the same family, and Orange County and Africa Parker arranging between them a quote co-partnership and joint trade in quote the art the art mystery and business of a distiller, end quote, for 12 years. 
By December 8th of the next year, Parker owned interest in the land upon which the tavern now sits and had begun distilling and brewing there. Um, his still was quoted as serving many local taverns. So I'll point out here, we now have a black man in 1800, 65 years before the end of the Civil War, who's a property and business owner in North Carolina. His partner is the grandson of someone who was formerly enslaving him. It's a tangled web. So, Alfred Parker deeds and trust to William Kane in Blah, 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 blah. I think also 1800, yeah. Africa Parker deeds and trust to William Kane, who once enslaved him, David Ray and James Yarborough, merchants in Hillsborough, security for three separate debts, his interest in the brewery and distillery, with the still house, two stills, and anything still connected to it. What this is really saying is that the business was doing well and they were taking business loans. The very next year, the debts were paid off by Thomas Watt. So again, they were doing good business. They got the loan. They paid their loan off the next year. And that's as far as I've been able to trace this person. A couple of interesting notes about Africa. He could read and write and would often include a freed man in his signature. And based on information from the Register of Deeds in Orange County, he was probably the first African-American business owner in the county and definitely the first African-American property owner. And he was a brewer and distiller. That's Africa Parker. Now we're gonna jump ahead a few hundred years to 1976. And we're gonna talk about someone else I've done some research on, Pat Henry. And it is a Miller logo and a presentation project about craft beer. So feel free to pick on me about that. So on June 29th, 1976, Miller Brewing made a public announcement that they intended to build a production facility in Eden, which is Rockingham County, right north of us, what would become one of the largest capital investments the state had ever seen at that time. By 1977, there were over 5,000 people hoping for employment in the company and were in fact standing in employment lines outside the building. One of those was 30-year-old Patricia Pat Henry, a Reesville native and graduate of Bennett College. Henry had just left a position with DuPont in Martinsville, Virginia to return to North Carolina and had no experience in the brewing industry, but did hold a degree in chemical engineering from Bennett. And it was, her interviewer commented they thought her resume showed potential as a future brewmaster. She was hired as a brewing supervisor and commented that she remembered on the first day on the job in 1977 because it was so early in operations that there, quote, were no workers. They didn't even have walls up in the brew house. And though she would eventually manage four brewers in the role, she and the other supervisors were actually the ones working the lines themselves until they, Miller was actually able to hire enough employees to handle the production lines. By 1983, she was promoted to a position as head of the bottling operations, a position she held until she fulfilled her interviewer's prediction and became brewmaster, at that point making her not only the first female brewmaster at a major brewery in the country, but the first African-American female brewmaster as well. She supervised 40 brewers, held the position from 1992 until 1994, when she was again promoted, this time to packaging manager, supervising over 300 employees in 14 different production lines. In May of the next year, you can see she's very upwardly mobile. In May of the next year, she was made plant manager in charge of the entire Eden operation. Henry found herself again, the first woman in the country to have ever held that position in a major brewery. Reflecting upon this, she said that, quote, to be a couple of firsts in this business that in the past has predominantly been male dominated, that's something I'm very proud of. I look at it as, whether as a trailblazer or not, I want to make sure that what I'm doing will make, make it easier for my daughter if my daughter wanted to come into something like this or anybody coming in behind me, end quote. Under Patricia Henry's leadership, the Eden Brewery was the third most profitable of Miller's brewing operations. And when morale was low due to changes in the industry, Miller's faltering profits and inevitable layoffs, she allowed employees to fish in the company pond and hunt in the surrounding woods. She was also respected by the union leaders at the brewery, with locals president Jack Cipriani noting that he had, quote, known her over 20 years, and the one thing that he that he has impressed that bleh, the one thing that has impressed me about her is her character. She keeps her word, end quote. Henry left the brewery to become Miller's director of strategic projects in 2005, and eventually left the industry altogether to become a director of BB&T Corporation in 2013. 
That's Patricia Henry. She's still alive. Also still alive uh, is the awesome Lee Benevitz. Um, so just to give you a little bit of context, we, we, we've left Miller and, and the big beer companies and now going smaller and to craft and um, what at the time was largely called micro breweries. So in 1965, Anchor Brewing opened in San Francisco. Um, that was really the spark for a craft brewing revolution in the United States, at least on the West Coast. Um, Ten years later, probably the, if not one of the most important breweries that's not in operation anymore, um, New Albion opened. So uh, Jack McAuliffe opened New Albion Brewing in Sonoma in 1976. It was one of those places where everybody throughout the region who was interested in beer, everybody who wanted to open a brewery, everybody who wanted to learn about home brewing would go there and talk with Jack McAuliffe. Um, he kind of embodied the industry's DIY experience, like spirit. He welded dairy equipment to convert it into commercial brewing tanks because it's not like he could just kind of go out and buy them. Um, everything, everything that was in use, he made in some way, shape or form because there just was not an industry. Um, two years later, in 1978, homebrewing was federally legalized. Interestingly, Jimmy Carter, known as a non-drinker, was the one who legalized that. And in the years following, many avid homebrewers decided to make a business out of their hobby. By January of 1985, 100 craft breweries were operating across the United States. For context, in North Carolina, we have about 340 today. But January of 1985, 100 craft breweries were operating across the U.S. Almost, most were on the West Coast, but um, many other states had started legalizing um, craft brewing at this point. I'll be honest, it took a little while, as well as a uh, German immigrant with an expired green card to bring craft brewing to North Carolina. In 1980, Uli, uh, Uli Benevitz moved to Eastern North Carolina working as a farm manager and an agricultural land developer in the small community of Inglehard on the Pamlico, Pamlico Sound. He got a call one day from his brother in Munich offering to sell him some brewery equipment. Uli, who missed the beer uh, of his home country, bought the equipment and had it shipped over to North Carolina hoping to open a small restaurant and brewery in the town of Manio. That's the city where he and his wife had decided to settle down. It was only after making that equipment purchase and getting the equipment over here that Uli realized there was a little bit of a hitch in his plan. The state of North Carolina didn't allow breweries to sell their beer to customers on site. Undeterred, Uli, again, a German immigrant with an, with an expired green card at this time, worked with the state's uh, Alcoholic Beverage Control Commission to change the law of North Carolina and to really open the gateway to the craft brewing industry in the state today. Um, Uli crafted language to expand the existing law that uh, impacted wineries. So wineries at this point were allowed to sell for consumption on site. So he basically just went in and said, scratch out the word wine, put in the word beer. Um, State Senator uh, Mark, Mark Bass Knight, who was the person who uh, represented the Manteo area, sponsored Senate Bill 536 in 1985. And he framed it as a bill supporting uh, what he called, quote, a little hobby project on the Outer Banks. The bill was titled um, an act to allow on-premise sales of beer at many breweries, many M-I-N-I, -I, not M-A-N-Y, at tiny breweries. And it passed the North Carolina House in June and the Senate in July of 1985. So July 4th, 1985, interestingly, was the day that microbrewing, craft breweries, officially were allowed in North Carolina. It really opened the floodgates. Uli led the way when he opened Weeping Radish Brewing in Manio the following year. 
1986. He opened a second location for weeping radish in Durham in 1988. Um, Green Shields Brewery in Raleigh and then Dilworth Brewing in Charlotte followed soon after both opening in 1989. And in 1990, Greensboro got the state's fifth brew pub when Loggerhead Brewing Company opened on Vandalia Road. But all of this traces back to Uli who, um, you know, really opened the gateway, opened the flood, opened everything up. He, he is a, he's a personality. Um, you're weird. If you want to see Uli interacting with someone else who's weird and wacky, he's been on two episodes of Diners, Drive-Ins, and Dives, so you can see him hanging out with Gaffietti, making sausage, literally, with Gaffietti. Um, but last year, Uli actually sold Weeping Radish. It's been bought up by a developer in, uh, based out of, I believe, Raleigh, if I'm not mistaken. Um, the, the understanding is that the brewery part will continue, the restaurant will continue, but at this point, it's, it's not 100% sure. Um, it probably won't reopen in any capacity because it's on the Outer Banks until next spring. But, um, you know, Uli, Uli is an immigrant who made an impact on North Carolina beer. Oscar Wong, who opened Highland, um, another person who Oscar is actually an immigrant from Jamaica. He's from Jamaica, but he's of Chinese descent. Um, North, the North Carolina craft brewing industry today would not be where it is without, without immigrants coming in and bringing their experiences from outside the country um, into North Carolina. So that's your quick rundown of some of the interesting folks. Um, Richard, do you want to give a quick shout out to the awesome gentleman in the picture on this slide? Sure, that that gentleman, and I believe he was on our very first slide as well, his name is Chap Bodenhamer, and he was the owner of a saloon in Winston-Salem. He's one of the few people we actually identified as a both a, a person and photographs, and we have photographs of them, and we actually know where their saloon was located, Chap Bodenhamer. And yes, he has magnificent hair. I think Richard could actually sport that hair. I think he's got the hairstyle, the cut to do it. Um, I've I told him he should go as Chap Bodenhamer for like Halloween one year. Then everyone has to listen to him when he explains who he is. Um, but anyways, that's your quick rundown. That's some stories about um, well crafted and where it intersects with larger issues, larger pieces of history. Um, I'm happy, you know, we're happy to answer questions. I think I saw David's name pop up on here too. So as y'all know, David also works with us on the project. Um, he, he might be able to pop in with some answers. David doesn't want questions that would involve interacting with humans. And we all know how David feels about that. Um, but if y'all have any questions, um, happy to answer them about anything we talked about today or the project or even the research question that I, uh, the research lead that I'm doing. Uh, Shelby has a question. She'd like to know uh, where to go. How long was Africa enslaved to the Quaker and how was he freed? Um. Good question. He was enslaved to do different Quakers over a period of time, starting in the mid 1780s. Um, he was freed in 1789. It was very much the um, the slave his enslaver emancipated him because of the work he did um, teaching the um, enslaver and the other slaves how to brew beer and distill because. Really, in a way, as best I've been able, and some of this is coming between the lines, I have to say. Um, he, one, one line of thought on it is he basically bought his own freedom in that they were going to make enough money distilling and brewing that he earned his freedom by teaching them how to do it. The other is the second Quaker um, who enslaved him really enslaved him for only a few months. So there is another line of thought with this particular person that perhaps um, 
enslaving him was something of a way to lead him towards emancipation. The same cannot be said for the pre, obviously the previous Quaker who enslaved him. So that was a longer term. That was, um, he very much just lost him in, you know, a defaulted loan. It wasn't, you know, it doesn't, there's no question what happened there. It's all in documents and written up. Does that answer the question? Uh, let's see. Besides questions for David, so um, I don't know if that's a comment or a question that the Quakers and Moravians were both so involved with brewing. Well, Moravians are German, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah so the Moravians were who brought beer, right? At least in terms of what we know that's documented to North Carolina, um, to the Fabra. That's the first documented brewery, a formal kind of operation that we know of in the state. And they brew for the community, but they also uh, would sell to uh, strangers, the outsiders. <laughs> um, yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, Brother. Do you want to talk about Brother Heinrich? Uh, Brother Fieldhausen was, as we, he was the first brewer there, thus making him, as far as we're aware, the first professional brewer in the state. Um, I think what Aaron's getting at is he did not last, he lasted about 10 years before he was sent back to Pennsylvania for committing carnal sins. We don't know what that means. Um, could have meant anything. Um, we actually have, we have a pretty complete line of the first professional brewers assuming they started in the fabric in the state because there's a pretty direct line because Marines are excellent record keepers from the Fabra to Old Salem. So we know that entire path of who was brewing what through that that period. To answer Kathleen's question about do they drink it or just sell it, they drink the beer because it was calories and it's safer than the water. Um, they wanted the calories. Um, the hard stuff was specifically for strangers who was basically any person outside of the community. So there were, and that line, um, you find doing the research caused a lot of problems in the community. There was no surprise in any of this. There was a lot of back and forth about alcohol in the community. Um, their taverns opened and closed. Um, you can visit one of the taverns in Old Salem and uh, Brewer's House in Bethabra still today. Yeah, and I will say, so one of the other things, we actually, going talking about the Moravians and being excellent record keepers, um, we actually have a copy of one of the beer recipes. It's in Old German, um, of course, but, um, you know, we're not talking about, they're not chugging down, you know, triple IPAs that are 14%. These are very low um, ABV beers that really are, um, it's, it's a way to sterilize the water to be perfectly honest, um, they maybe have one, two percent alcohol in them, extremely, extremely um, low ABV. And that's what you see in a lot of places that have um, brewing traditions as well as traditions for of drinking beer, you know, during the day at lunch um, because the water is safer. You, you see beers that are under three percent, which, you know, here in the U.S., Finding a beer under 3% is not going to be easy because no one's going to make it because it's not going to sell. Um, but yeah, it was it was brewing, honestly, for 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 boiled water and and flavor. It was one step beyond what we would do for sweet tea now. And I'll I'll answer another part of what I saw. Kathleen's questions because she's asking about Quakers and Moravians involved in brewing. Quakers are teetotalers. Um, any involvement they were having in the alcohol industry is pretty much on the business side. Um, beyond beyond that, um, yeah, they 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 very much they're very much on the side of abstinence. The Moravians, on the other hand, were a very different story. Well. Thank you, Aaron and Richard. I'm going to go have a beer now for lunch, I think, because I'm worried about the water. Um, if the water, if the water in the library ever goes bad, we're all going to Old Town. Nice. I can. All right. Remind me sometime to tell you the story about the water at Grandover and why it was too nasty for Budweiser to build a brewery there. But you can put a resort, have a lovely time.
Oh, Lord. Okay. Thanks for the tip to not, um, places not to vacation. Well, you all have a great rest of the day, the weekend, Pat Jasper for me. Um, see you all on the flip side. Thank you everyone for coming. Thanks. Bye.